Hey everybody, happy Sunday. Welcome to session two of our paint along for the Celtic busts. Um, as usual, I am less organized than I'd hoped to be. Um, it has been a crazy, crazy summer. Summer's always busy for me, as I've explained in the past. It's kind of the most busy time of year for, for what I do. Um, and this has just been a particularly crazy summer. So, I mean, I have not even really taken a day off in weeks. Um, the one day off, or occasionally when I'll have a day off, it's more like a working day, like yard work, or uh, yesterday I did basically almost a half day um, like garage sale, and then I was packing a bunch of boxes for shipping last night. So I haven't really like had a chance to unwind in a while. And so today, woke up super early, had to do a full day of work um, before the stream started today. So. If I seem a little out of it at any point, it's because I'm quite exhausted, but I'm happy to be here with you guys, happy to be painting the busts, just to give you kind of an idea about how things have been. So since last Sunday when we did our first session, uh, the extent of my hobby time has been to base coat Hamish's hair and beard. That's all the time I've had to do any hobbying this last week. So happy to be back at my painting table. One more paint to shake up for today. Scale 75 paints are pretty thick. They, they require quite a lot of shaking and save my elbow and, and stuff. Hey, Mr. Heath, what's up? Um, I have a little automated paint shaker. So I like to shake all my colors I know I'm going to use before the session, and then I can just give them a light shake before I use them. So we're doing the last one. <clears throat> so just kind of, again, give you a little bit of a recap where we're at. This is what we're ultimately going for. Hamish is not quite done yet. All I've done is base coat his hair and his beard. So that all needs to be finished and his ax needs to be finished. So those two things still need to be finished on Hamish. Um, Wallace is all done. So this is ultimately what we're gonna be shooting for is to get our paint job to look a lot like this guy. We're already getting there a bit. So the, the face is mostly done. There's probably gonna be a few places I wanna go back up and hit um, a couple highlights like on his cheekbones, his nose, his forehead, kind of like this model has a, has a few more defined uh, highlight areas on some of those spots. Probably eventually do that. Eyes look a little bit different on these guys. Um, um, this guy was the one we painted before we started the bust. So I actually ended up doing a little bit lighter blue on him. Um, when I went with him, I did a more, little bit more gray blue. Um, you can see a little bit of a difference in their eyes. This guy looks a little weird. I'm kind of getting a, um, like, a, oh shoot, I just forgot his name. Um, Christopher Walken vibe from this guy right now. Um, but what, what happens is he looks a little weird because we haven't painted his hair yet. So his flesh tones are going into the hair, which gives him this kind of weird halo thing around his head, um, which m most of that will get, you know, kind of tamed down once we start base coating the hair. Uh, but this is where we got to last week. We did the flesh tones on um, William Wallace. Same flesh tones on Hamish. Uh, have not painted his eyes yet. I was going to show you how you can do eyes later. Um, so we'll eventually do the eyes on him, see if we have time today. But the main thing I want to focus on today... Cool. I'm, I'm glad you're enjoying a relaxing Sunday, Heath. Um, I want to do the tartan. Uh, you can see I painted these both the same actually, but Wallace's looks a little brighter. Um, that was not necessarily intentional, but I know what happened. Uh, when I do the eventual glazing, I think I just did a little bit more targeted glazing on him. And then when I went back over everything with the browns and knock some things down, do some shadowing, I think I did a little bit more uniform uh, glazing with the brown to knock down some of the brightest spots on, on his. So they, his looks like it's a little bit more highlighted a little less highlighted no big deal um, use the same colors for the two of them so we're going to go through the process of how how we get this color how we get this texture in there how we get the shadows and all of that stuff so that is our main goal today we'll get as far as i can get uh, by 4 30 my time so a little over two hours anything we don't finish up we'll pick up next time um, so the first thing we need to do is we need to figure out what colors we're going to paint this thing so let's consult our reference photo. Um, the steely-eyed glare of Mel Gibson here. Um, 
So if we look at the three main colors of the tartan, so we've got this lighter green color, we've got a darker green color, and this sort of orangish brown color. Um, so we need to figure out the base colors for the three of these things. Um, now the trick with this is, and I, I see your question, Heath, I'll, I'll, when I start getting into the painting and I have nothing else to talk about, I'll talk about that. Um, so if you look, we have this, this uh, thread texture on the, um, on the various spots. And so I'm going to end up painting a lot of that texture on there later, which means we're going to be putting some layers on top of our base color, which is going to change it. We're also going to do some glazing and things like, like I usually do. So what's tricky is getting the right base color, knowing that it's not exactly the color you're going to end up with because of the layers that are going to go on top of it. Um, so for the, the sample models that I did, so for these, I'll kind of squeeze him in here next to his likeness. So for the, for the darker green areas, I used the Scale 75 color Rift Green uh, from their Fantasy and Games line. When you put this on, it's going to look super dark green. It's not going to quite, it's not going to really look anything like what he's got there. But really, what we have to do is go into the, the darkest parts of that green and kind of see what that color is, which is hard to isolate because your eye wants to look at it as a whole. But what we have is we have actually a really dark, cool color green in the back, and then the thread or the kind of worn spots where the color is wearing off is a much lighter, um, more muted green. So we need like a darker, cool green to be the base coat here. So the Rift Green is going to do good for that. You're also going to notice that this is not one of the scale color. This is one of the Fantasy and Games line, which have a satin finish. So as we put it on, you're actually going to see that this one's going to have some sheen to it. No big deal. We're going to be putting layers on top that's going to knock a lot of that down. Uh, I always use Tester's Dull Coat when I'm done with the model anyway to kind of even out any of the finishes of the paints that I use. So um, it won't be shiny when we're all done. But you're going to notice that this one's going to be shiny and the other colors won't really be uh, shiny. The other color for the lighter green area, we're going to start with... It's going to be a mixture of a couple things. So this Field Gray 2 from the Warfront paint line. Um, it's a little hard to see here. Um, looks a little different on screen. It's kind of a, a green with a little gray in it. So it's a little bit of a desaturated green. I'm going to add just a touch of the Merm green to kind of unify it with the green that's next to it. Um, I'm also going to add just a little bit of Far Brown. So a little bit of a neutral color, further desaturated a bit. Um, so we'll see what that looks like when we mix the three of them together. And for these sample models, I used um, brown leather from scale, or sorry, orange leather from scale 75 to do the orangish brown part. However, I'm, I think it looks okay on, on Hamish's bust, but I actually think it came out a little more orange than I wanted. Um, so I probably this time will add just a hint of brown to the orange leather. Um, just push it a little bit more to the brown uh, tones instead of just the orange tones. Um, so this is what we're ultimately going for. You'll also notice he's got these um, dark lines that appear every so often. It's kind of weird. I, I haven't found a, a better picture than this, but he's got this one. You can't see my cursor. I'm moving my cursor and pointing stuff. You can't see that. Um, he's got these dark lines that kind of go um, like in parallel with the stripes and they go in between the lighter green and the orange stripes is where they're at. It looks like he's got one that goes the other way, but I don't see that one duplicated anywhere else really in the design, fabric design, so I just skipped it. I didn't do that. But if we wanted to, we could do some vertical stripes every so often that go perpendicular to the, um, the stripes. It's not a big deal. I don't... Um, I didn't do that for these guys, and I think they came out uh, looking pretty accurate with how their, their uh, tartan went. So I'm not going to do that on these either, but you can feel free to, to add that in later. So this is what we're going to try to do. Um, so my suggestion when you're working on this, uh, the trickiest part is kind of like getting the stripes to all be the same thickness. So what you could do is you could base coat the entire thing and say like the orange leather and then start adding in your green stripes. But I just found it's easier to control the stripes if I literally paint on every single stripe myself and just kind of do the alternating colors. So I'm going to mix up each of the three stripe colors. So 
we'll have our darkest color. Have the next green color. Add in just a touch of the rift green. And add some thar brown to that. I don't remember the exact ratios, but hey, it was all good. And then some orange leather, and I'm gonna add just a little bit of brown leather to that. these up the uh, fantasy and games line is a little bit thinner paint too than the scale color line so it doesn't need quite as much thinning And we just need to pick a place to start on these guys. So I'll start with Wallace here. So pick a place to, to start and then your first line is going to kind of dictate the flow of everything else because we're going to try to follow whatever pattern we do. So when you look at the way the cloth folds, what you might want to do is kind of imagine what the flow of the fabric might be. So starting off, I want to go perpendicular to the edge of the fabric. So pick a spot, kind of go perpendicular. Um, follow along, so I think it'll be kind of go like this. It'll maybe round off down into the, the fold a little bit, back up, across, back down, kind of start to work its way across a little bit, maybe back down. Just kind of go with the flow, figure out a, a direction for the line. The next thing is now figure out a thickness, and you're going to try to duplicate this thickness all the way across. Um, later, we're going to be putting in like texture in there. Um, if you don't feel like you have a brush with a nice enough point, or if you want to start doing some dry brush, which I'll talk about how you can do some dry brush to add the texture in or some stippling or something, you might want to do slightly thicker lines if you don't kind of trust yourself to do the super duper thin texture within each stripe. So um, the other thing is the thinner you make the stripe, the more stripes you need. So the more times you have to go back and forth between the color and do that kind of stuff. So it's really up to you. Make the stripes as, as thick as you want. So follow along your pattern. Establish a thickness that you're happy with. Try to work and get that, that consistency, uh, that thickness consistent.
Don't worry if you get paint on another part of the model. It hasn't really been painted yet. All right, so I'm pretty happy with that thickness. I'm pretty happy with the, the uh, flow of the, the stripe. Now we go back to our reference picture really quick here. Because in terms of how it's folding on him, um, we painted the lighter green. So the lighter green, the darker green goes on top of that, and then the orange next. So orange is below the lighter green, uh, dark green is on top of the lighter green. So then we just switch to our next color and start establishing the next stripe. I'm just going to follow right along the edge of that lighter green one. And then once I do that, I'll, I'll um, establish the appropriate thickness for it. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start flipping back and forth between Wallace and Hamish to get the stripes on both models. And it's just going to be a, a quite a bit of a period here of just painting stripes on. Um, so while I do that, I'll talk a little bit about yesterday. Um, so yesterday I went to, well, first of all, on Friday, my brother calls me and said that he just found out that there was a I'm kind of out of the loop in the local gaming community. I don't really go to the gaming stores much anymore. I don't really play games, and as I mentioned earlier, super busy with work. So I'm I'm really unplugged at the moment from the local scene. And uh, he found out on Friday that there is a that there was a gamers garage sale, or I think they call it mercenary market, where you go and you rent table space at the game store, and then it's just a giant garage sale. So people come. They give you cash or you can do PayPal or the store will run it through their register if you want it that way, but then they just give you store credit. But it's just like a giant like flea market for used um, gaming stuff, used or new. Some people are selling stuff that's never actually been used before. Um, but you just make your own deals, you make money and whatever. And so, um, our primary reason for going was actually to try to sell more busts. Um, so I took the painted busts along, made a little display up, you know, inviting people to join in the paint along, buy some busts and join in the paint along. That was our primary reason. But I, I also really thought that it'd be a good opportunity as I'm starting to get buried in backlog. You know, models, just too many models, things, too many models for me to ever uh, paint. It was a good opportunity to get rid of a lot of stuff. So Friday night after I got done work and then I got home from rock climbing, went through all my drawers and cabinets and everything. I just asked myself, would I be upset if I never got to paint this model? And if the answer was no, it went in the pile. So I took a lot of models and bases and all sorts of stuff that I just had bought at some point, fully intending to paint them, but I'm just not as excited about those models now or just know I have too much stuff to paint. So, And so between in-person sales and the awesome people who follow me on various social media outlets, I was able to eventually sell everything that I wanted to sell yesterday. Which was a very cathartic experience. It's very, very nice to go from feeling a little bit overwhelmed by the amount of stuff that you own that you have to paint to only being, you know, slightly overwhelmed by the amount of stuff that you have uh, unpainted. Um, 
I certainly still have quite a few models, but at least this point now, the only things I own are stuff that I really do want to paint, um, which is primarily actually a lot of busts and a lot of 75 millimeter models. Um, at this point, I now own very, very few 32 millimeter models, except the Atlantis Miniatures stuff that I'll be getting into next. But in terms of for my myself, and I'm really, really enjoying painting these larger scale models. So that's mostly what I kept. Um, I do have a few 32 millimeter models that are still coming from some old Kickstarter things I backed. Um, but, you know, for the most part, I'm really enjoying these larger models. So yeah, my backlog now, I would say that I have probably about a dozen 75 millimeter scale models. I have probably eight busts that aren't the Celtic busts. Um, three large dragons. Those are BC. <laughs> we'll, we'll see if I ever um, can carve out the time to paint those. So three large dragons. Um, maybe still like 10 or so. That might even be generous. Maybe five 32 millimeter models. Uh, again, not counting the Atlantis miniature stuff. Um, and just a couple miscellaneous like minotaurs and, and trolls and things like that that are, you know, they're more closer to a 75 millimeter scale model, but they're not that scale. So yeah, it made a huge difference. Um, also put a little, you know, put a little money in my pocket, which is not bad. You just have to forget what you actually paid for them in the first place, and then you can feel good about the money you got back for them. Um, so yeah, the Atlantis miniature stuff I still have. Obviously, I'm working through, or about to start working through their, the rest of their dwarf line. So I have a few dwarfs. I'm still waiting on the last, or more shipments for him to send me the rest of the dwarf models, but I still have a few of those. And I have, um, I have a, one of their trolls still. And I have a juvenile dragon, which is a, a much smaller dragon model. And I also just remembered that I have a couple models from their Kickstarter that are still going to be due as well. I didn't buy tons of that um, in their mythology range. I bought a couple of werewolves, uh, bought the Cyclops, uh, maybe a Hippogriff, I don't know, maybe five models or so from their mythology Kickstarter. That was last year's Kickstarter. I think it was last year. Maybe it was the beginning of this year. I don't remember. They have an ogre Kickstarter that's going to be starting pretty soon. His take on the ogres is really sweet. By the way, the, he's doing a painting competition right now. Atlantis Ministers is doing a painting competition. So if you have some of their dwarves, um, he's running a painting competition with different uh, prizes for people. And there's a couple different categories. So if you're a professional painter, you can compete in that category. If you're just a novice painter, you can compete in a novice category. But yeah, yesterday was, it was a much longer day than I anticipated. I had expected uh, setup was at nine, market opened at 10. I kind of figured in the past when I've done those before, they kind of die down after about an hour and a half or two hours. But this one really kept having a steady stream of people until about two or 2.30 when I left and there were still some people milling around. Um, and then by the time I got all packed up, got to say goodbye to people, got home, got everything unpacked. 
um, packed up. I had about a dozen people who were online who bought stuff that I put out. So then I had to pack all those boxes. Um, by the time I got all done, it was about six o'clock and then Alyssa and I, my wife, we went out, got some dinner. That was mostly my day yesterday. So unfortunately, I had intended to put in about half a day of work yesterday, try to make today and tomorrow a little bit lighter. Didn't happen. But I'm very, very happy that I was able to sell everything. I'm happy other people were excited to get the models. It's a good day all around. Got to see a few people I haven't seen in a while because I haven't been going to the game stores. So that was fun too. But that kind of made for at least even a more hectic day. I was trying to get everything set up and then get pictures posted online for people online to get first dibs at everything. But I ended up a little late. I had to come, I left something at home. I had to run back for it. Didn't get everything set up until the doors were already open and people were mobbing tables. And in between, you know, just talking to people coming around to the tables and catching up with people I hadn't seen in a while. It's just a very, very hectic, hectic day. So I have a stripe, uh, three, each of the three uh, colors painted for each of these guys. Have, have you ever been to one of those, um, like Mercenary Market Gamers Garage Sales, Mr. Heath? So anyway, I have basically one set of three stripes painted on each guy. What I'm going to start doing is going like down and up at the same time. So I'm going to try to fill these out a little bit faster. The You'll notice that right now, it really doesn't look too much like what we're shooting for, you know. The magic will be in the later steps, for sure. Um, I said I use basically the same colors on this model. You can see how different they look when they're all done. So the magic will be in the later steps. Um, the last comments I'll make about this before I just keep working is, once we get the stripes to kind of go we're, we have them working behind this leather strap. Um, I want to try to visualize where those stripes are actually going to come out at. Most people probably wouldn't even notice if I just guessed, but I don't know. I'm very uh, particular. So I'm actually going to kind of sketch out real quick the approximate widths of. what would be behind that letter. So it looks like we're going to essentially have dark green um, as our next uh, thing coming out below the leather strap for this guy. I'll do the same thing for Hamish when I get to that part. Hey, what's up, man? It's good to see you, Sulaco. That's Jesse, right? I'm trying to remember who, uh, I think that's Jesse. Although you can also tell me if you don't want me to use your real name. Welcome, man.
Will do. Just give me a heads up, you know, when you want to go more incognito. Then I'll just say, Sulaco, who is definitely not Jesse. Bing. That'll that'll help keep your cover, you know, for sure. By the way, at the moment, um, I've got a ne the next shipment of dice bags incoming. So if anybody missed out on the first set of dice bags, and uh, <laughs> clearly I've got some moles. Have you seen the viewer list? It's like you know, 30 people. I bet you 29 of them are moles. Just kidding. Nobody's watching. <laughs> Not nobody. I have my loyal few, which I greatly, greatly value. But let's face it, they're not featuring me on the front cover of the uh, of Twitch at the moment. Anyway, what I was saying, so I have more of the dice bags incoming. Uh, if you guys missed out and you want one of those, just a reminder that 100% uh, of the purchase price for those is getting donated to charity. So I have either five or six coming in that are still unspoken for as of the time of this recording. So if you want in on that, send me a message on social media. Um, dice bags cost me $25 roughly to make. So I had to get the special fabric printed and then um, have them made out by grade have them made by grade out productions. Um, so I'm asking at least twenty-five dollars. If you want to give more, hundred percent of it gets donated to charity. I had a couple of them with me at the, the, garage, the gamer's garage sale yesterday. And I had a sign up about the, the charity. And what was funny was there was a guy who walked up and was like, oh, you're selling the gorilla with the fresh dice bags. I saw these on the, you know, the local Facebook post. Do you guys, are, you, are you guys just collecting donations for the animal charity too? And he just wanted to give me money to give to the animal charity. I was like, yeah, sure. And I started describing a little bit about what I do and you know, donating money and stuff. He didn't even realize I was actually Gorilla with a Brush until like halfway through that conversation. <laughs> My human disguise fooled him. But it was cool, he just gave a cash, uh, cash donation for me to add to the, don the, uh, the total to donate. So that was really cool. He was telling me some stories about adopting dogs from the local Arizona Animal Welfare League, which is what I was supporting, and so he was really excited I was doing that. Hey, see, Mr. Heath, I really appreciate you stopping by. Uh, I do have shirts. In fact, I have an unlimited supply of shirts because I ended up deciding, because I have no, I have no good way to anticipate what kind of styles of shirts people would like, you know, like fitted, relaxed fit, tank top, polo shirts, or whatever. I had no idea really how to anticipate what people would like, nor what size distribution to get. Um, and then male shirts and female shirts and just all sorts of different stuff. Baby clothing, what have you. 
So I just ended up making a Cafe Press web store. So you can go to cafepress.com uh, slash gorilla with a brush. Um, you can also go to my, my website. There's a link under shop. There's a direct link over to my Cafe Press web store. Um, I posted about it too on social media. You can probably find that post or you can message me if you're having trouble finding it. But just my story it has tons and tons of t-shirt designs, different fabrics, different cuts, male shirts, female shirts, mugs. There's a flask on there, baseball caps. Um, what else is on there? I think there's a shot glass. There's iPhone covers. Um, there's all sorts of things. Hey, Casual Painter, what's up? So over on my Cafe Press store, you can get any of that stuff. And um, I don't have to actually put out the money to start it. So they just take care of everything and people can order um, you know, whatever they want. There's tons and tons of designs. If you don't see something there that you would like, um, let me know. I can add it to the store. I tried to be really good about um, paying attention to dark shirts versus light shirts and what what design was on there because one of the designs has the name has the logo and the name on it but then the for the dark shirts the name wouldn't really show up so I took the name off of the designs for the dark shirts but if I missed one let me know sometimes it's weird you kind of have to like click on the actual picture of the shirt to get what it really looks like but yeah and then they give me a cut of the sales for those and what I've decided to do is just give 100% of the profits I make off of those shirt sales um, also to the animal charities that I support. So I'm not going to keep any of the money they send me for those. I'm just going to donate it all to charity. So, you know, get some Gorilla with a Brush gear. Know that uh, you're doing some good with that because a portion of those sales is going to charity. I ordered a, a couple t-shirts just to kind of check out what they look like when they arrive. Um, they're, supposed to, they're supposed to come this week, so probably by the next stream I'll have them and I'll probably wear them when I, when I paint on stream from now on. And then I also ordered a mug, because you know, sound like fun. So I'll show those off when I get them. Um, but yeah, hopefully you guys order some. Um, that'd be awesome. If you do, take pictures, send me, send them to me of you uh, wearing your gear. Hey, Small Adventure, what's up? We're just painting some stripes on, on Tartan right now. base coating everything. We're going to make some magic happen later and add cloth texture and shading and all of that fun stuff. But for right now, just blocking out the color regions. Um, for those of you guys who showed up late, we're using this reference picture to help us out. And ultimately, once we're all done, it's going to look something like this. So we still have a ways to go. There's lots of magic that needs to happen, but we're just blocking out the, the colors. Thanks, man. It's been a lot of fun to paint these. If anybody is interested in, in grabbing a pair of these busts, or even just one of them, wants to participate in the paint along, remember all of these, these videos are getting archived. So they'll be on Twitch for, I think, 60 days. But I'm also archiving them to YouTube. So whenever you purchase the bust, you can always go back and watch the first episodes and uh, learn how to paint these. But yeah, just go to my website. It's there on the screen, grillwithbrush.com. There's a, there's a tab that says Celtic Busts. Click on that. There's order forms. Um, if you'd rather not 
do that, I can send you an invoice. Just message me on one of my social media platforms. Give me your email address. I'll send you a PayPal invoice. Um, you can order them that way. There's only 90 of each bust that were produced and we're never gonna produce any more. So they're limited to that. Once they're gone, they're gone forever. Um, I will say that the first five of the numbered sets, so numbers one through, you, each one comes with a certificate of authenticity, like um, numbered, so you know which, which casting number you got. Um, casts one through five of each bust I am eventually going to paint. So the pairs that I have here now are, are one and two of each bust. I'm eventually going to paint five pairs of them. Each one's going to be a little different in terms of like, you know, the first pair that I painted, they're just kind of, there's nothing, you know, they're just the, the basic design, nothing too special. I'm going to do ones with the blue face paint, like in some parts of the movie. I'll do one where it's got the blood spatter on there, like they've been in battle. Um, maybe do one that's like a cooler tones, like it's nighttime, maybe some object source lighting with a fi campfire or something. Just, you know, really experiment, do some different things, but each bust, each pair of those busts will be different and they're all available for sale. So if you'd like, uh, like one of these pairs that I've painted, let me know. I'm going to be selling them for cheaper than what I normally charge for painting stuff. So that can be good if you just really like these busts and you just really like my paint job or if you're doing these on your own but you want the visual reference because they always look a little different when you see them in person um, you want the visual reference right in front of you kind of like i have when i'm going back and forth between the two of them um, let me know you can buy one of the painted sets have it there for you and then go back and watch the videos and try to duplicate it on your own with the reference right in front of you Anybody do anything cool this weekend? What I should be doing is going back and forth here so I don't have to switch paint colors every time or as quite as often. Yeah, that, that doesn't sound like fun. My wife does home staging. She uh, helps people prep their houses, especially if they're vacant homes for, for the resale market. And so a couple times a week, up to a couple times a week, I sometimes have to help her. You know, moving furniture, hanging artwork, stuff like that. Not, not my most enjoyable, not the most enjoyable activities in the world. 
especially if you live someplace warm. You survived though, I'm glad that you, you made it through that hot, humid day yesterday. Cool. I like some of the, the brisket, I think she has a couple different versions, right? Her, uh, one of her new versions, or maybe it's an alternate sculpt or something, is some really, really cool miniature. Did you say you were painting those gill ball teams up for yourself or were they a commission for, for people? We're on the same color on the two of them. Now I can actually go back and forth and butchers are commissioned, the masons you're gonna be painting are your own. Got all the alchemists painted up but still the masons and pay some debts. Cool. I had a couple of years. <laughs> Maybe a couple out of my twenty years of Maybe more than that. About half the time in the last 20 years, I've been able to fund all of my hobby through painting for people. So just use only, only money that I got from painting models for other people to get um, stuff for myself, which was always nice. The, the years I was most hardcore into playing, that was always a little trickier because I had spent more time painting my own stuff and spent more time playing. Playing less makes it a little easier to, to fund the hobby because I'm not really buying armies and stuff. And I'm doing more painting, which usually means more money.
There's a wild cat running wind sprints through the house right now. <laughs> and what's funny when he does that, because he, he runs through the tile areas, and he's a very, he's a long-haired cat, so he gets a lot of fur on his feet. And he doesn't have any traction on the tile, so he just slides around like, kind of like a cartoon character going around corners and stuff. Yeah, I've I've gotten into 40k a couple different times in my life. It's definitely not cheap. First time I got into it, I played Foot Slogger uh, Orcs. So basically, just you know, uncountably many orc models on foot. Not only was that a, a big money investment, but the time investment to assemble them all. And then when it came time to actually start painting them, I realized that I would never be able to finish that many orcs. So I eventually ended up selling the army and bought Thousand Sons and Zinch Demons and stuff, which I actually got all the way to fully painted and then over the course of several years, and then ended up selling them too. I know the most recent edition of 40K has brought a lot of people back to the game. People seem to be enjoying it. Just got really burned out from playing for so long. I haven't found anything that's gotten me excited to get back into actually tabletop gaming. I gotta admit that the Harry Potter game was potentially intriguing to me when I thought it was just gonna be a like a freeform skirmish game. But then there was kind of some weird stuff with pre-orders and then it ends up it's kind of more like a board game I don't know, my, my enthusiasm kind of waned so still looking for that thing that'll get me back maybe it never happens if that's the case so be it but I had a lot of good times over the years and met a lot of good people doing tabletop gaming so Hey, cool, congratulations. You won best painted uh, guild ball team. That's awesome. I think the one thing that always got tricky for me, so I, I loved War Machine. I was a really hardcore War Machine player for like, and hardcore just me like that was my game I played it every week um, for quite a few years and I think it was one of the best design games but just sort of the like the bloated nature that it eventually got with how many different 
models and war casters and warlocks and war beasts and factions that it ends up having and how much that game relies on knowledge of what your opponent's models do. I just couldn't keep up and it, it got a little frustrating. I think it's a game that works really well at super high competitive levels for the people that want to devote a lot of time to that. I think it works really well for like smaller groups of friends that sort of grow their collections together so it's not a constant um, pressure of what you're facing. But in a relatively large size gaming community where you just kind of every time you play somebody you're playing you don't know what half their stuff does. It's tough. And keeping up with all the new releases and stuff just got a little got a little exhausting to be honest. I still I still really enjoyed my time playing it. I think it's a very well designed game but couldn't keep it up. And so while Guild Ball has quite a few fewer models, it's, I've often felt a little bit like that in terms of an intimidation factor of trying to get into Guild Ball because each model has so many different rules and so specialized and has all sorts of counterattacks and special plays and it feels like something that would be very difficult to jump into casually. I could be wrong about that, but that's sort of my my impression. Yeah, there was quite a lot of erratas, especially when I stopped playing, which was near the end of Mark II, they were doing quite a bit of constant shuffling around of things. And then Mark III dropped right. It was funny because I, I decided to quit just a couple months before Mark III was announced. And I had a lot of people that was like, oh, Mark III, this is totally your opportunity to get back in the game. And to me, it was actually kind of the opposite. It was very much the, no, I'm... I'm happy to not have to start back at square one. The game was already hard enough to keep to keep up with, let alone now relearning rules for everything that I had learned. Like I said, that's I, I don't want that to come across as being like I hate War Machine or you shouldn't play it or anything. I just found it difficult. Um, like I said, I, I think it's one of the best best designed games out there. A fun, tight, um, powerful rule set where you can really do stuff that you want to do. One of my big complaints with 40k was always things like, you know, you have a dreadnought and you get into combat with the dreadnought. You know, you send them in against some troops or something. And then you're just stuck in combat with these troops until one of the two sides kind of wipes out the other side. I think some of that's changed a little bit now, but it was always a little frustrating. Like, why should my giant stompy robot still have to stand there and fight against a couple orcs who can't even hurt him? But in War Machine, you've got, you know, they kind of took care of that. You can pick guys up and throw them. You can trample over them. You can headbutt them and knock them down. Um, kind of almost, you know, whatever you want to do with your big stompy robots and giant monsters, pretty much there's a rule that allows you to do it. Some big monster has a giant weapon. You're like, that's not a weapon I want to hit me. Your guy can run over there and, like, block up that arm and prevent him from using it, things like that. It was always really fun.
It also scratched my orc itch after I sold off my old orc army because I couldn't ever fathom painting it all. I played troll bloods and I painted them like orcs. And they became my surrogate orc army. I'm much more into board games these days. You know, something that you really, you learn over playing maybe just once or twice, you kind of get really get the mechanics down and then start building your strategy. But, you know, the rules don't change. You're not constantly fighting updates or erratas or stuff. It's just, you just sit down and have a nice time. That's kind of my speed these days. Makes me sound like an old man, but. I only feel old when I wake up in the morning. My wife and I celebrated our 14th wedding anniversary this week. That's another reason why I didn't quite get as much hobby done as usual. One of my normal hobby nights where I could usually sneak in a little bit of painting time. We went out and celebrated. Went and got some, some steaks and A good old time. Yeah, I haven't tried terraforming Mars yet. I've heard really good things about it. Some of my favorite games lately have been uh, Lords of Waterdeep. That's been a staple in our rotation for quite some time. It's just a really well-made worker placement game. I like that. We've been we've got the Harry Potter deck building game, and we've been playing a lot of that, which has been fun because it's the way it's designed. You start with year one. It's like the least complicated rules and cards and stuff. and all But all the cards have to do with book one slash movie one. And then once you beat that level, it's a cooperative deck building game. So you try together to beat the villains that are there. Once you beat that level, you go on to year two and so on and so forth. All the way up to year seven, it gets harder and more complex each year. Um, and then there's an expansion that adds like monsters and different things like that. So... That's been a lot of fun. It's kind of fun. It's just, you know, my wife and I both basically just play it together. But it's fun to not be competing each, competing against each other and just like, it's a pretty well made game too. Yeah, Lords of Waterdeep. Um, it's, it's kind of a reverse D&D &D concept. So um, you are one of the masked Lords of Waterdeep Harbor, which is or Waterdeep City, which is some city in the Dungeons and Dragons um, lore. And so it's run by these masked lords and nobody really knows their true identity. Um, but you, you're given a card, so you know your true identity, and each card tells you how you earn bonus points during the game. And so during the game, you are sending out your, your agents to recruit heroes to go complete quests for you. So, you know, kind of like when you play role-playing games, the heroes find some NPC and the NPC hires them to do a quest and then you are the heroes who go out and do the quest so this is kind of the reverse. So you're the guy hiring the heroes to go do quests for you and as they complete the quest you get gold and glory and um, recruit new people to your cause and things like that. So, um, But it's a, it's a fun worker placement game. You know, send your agent out, get stuff back, cash those in to, to complete quests. Um, the Dungeons and Dragons theme, if you really want to get into it, it, you can be very thematic. 
but it's also a little bit pasted on on top. So even if you have people who don't aren't really that into D and D, if you can just get them to try it once, uh, my experience is they'll like they'll really enjoy the game and want to keep playing it with you. Um, like I said, it's one of our staples, and my wife and her sister want, love to play it all the time, and they're definitely not D and D people. So um, yeah, it's one of our most famous games. Um, so it has some expansions which can make the game longer, and you can also, once you get the expansions, you can play the long game, which goes longer. Um, so it's hard to say about how many different versions there are. We usually play some of the longer games, but um, I would say it's, it's probably like a 90 minute game, an hour to, a ni to 90 minutes. Um, probably depends on how, how many new people you have. I mean, obviously the more used to the game, people will move a lot faster, uh, but it doesn't, it's not super duper long. Well, what's nice about it too is it's it's a set game length so it's eight rounds and every round each player places all of their agents and so you have like two or three or four agents depending on the number of players so it just kind of goes around you place your agents you get your stuff the next person places his agent gets his stuff you play some cards things like that but then after everybody's placed all their agents you collect all your people back from the board you move the turn marker and so there's only eight rounds, and it ends after eight rounds no matter what, and then you just tally up the final score. So it can't, you know, it doesn't, not one of these games that can really go too long, as long as people are actually playing, because um, it caps at um, eight rounds. Uh, another game I really enjoy is Kingsburg. If you've never played King, like Kingsburg, um, that's kind of a cool game. So all the players, each round, you, you roll dice, um, and uh, like you use the dice to influence members of the king's court. So all the king's courts are, are labeled from one to 18. You roll your three D6s. You can kind of use them in different combinations to influence different people at court. They give you back resources. You use that to build up uh, defenses of your little barony within the kingdom. And then at the end of every year, uh, bad guys come like goblins or orcs or a dragon or something. You have to fight them off or else you lose resources or lose buildings or things. And then you know whoever has the most points at the end of five years uh, wins. So that's another fun game and again it's capped. Like it only ever lasts a set number of rounds. That one's fun and the, the expansions on both of those games are, are definitely worth getting. All right so I have now painted all the stripes on these guys. I have to remember that I'm, I'm doing a paint along here. <laughs> I've got stuff to do. Um, next up I Let's see, should we do the dark line? I think I did that next. I forget the, the step I did. So uh, we have the dark line that goes between the lighter green and the brown. Uh, you can do this one later if you'd rather do the, the dark line later, but I'm just going to go ahead and do it now between the two lighter colors. So for this, I'm going to use I use the SS Camo Dark Brown. Um, it's just kind of a, a very blackish brown. You can just use dark brown for this if you want. You can use black if you really want. You can mix black and brown. It might even have a touch of purple, although you're really not going to see that because I'm going to keep it pretty dark. But um, so kind of hard to see on there, but yeah, it's. It's a black brown again with maybe a little bit of a, a purplish tinge to it. Let's get my fine detail brush and just paint this line right where the two lighter colors meet. This is one of those things if you're, this is your first time doing some freehand and you're a little intimidated at doing thin stripes like this, we could skip this step if you want. Um, if you're also watching this and planning to do the painting later, you could also um, base coat 
one of these colors with the dark brown and then just paint the other color on top of that leaving a little bit of a stripe there if that's more your speed probably a little more time consuming but it can work One thing you might notice is how I brace my hands, and this is really nice to help. Um, you know, sometimes like, you can brace your hand right on the, the bar. Um, other times, like you'll see what I'm doing here is I'm actually holding on like this, but then I'm bracing my other hand on my other hand. Um, but it's really important when you're doing fine detail work to have a contact point that's close to the model so that you can control your brush stroke really well. If you're just kind of like this with nothing to rest on, um, you're more likely to have um, problems getting the, the detail exactly like what you want. It's kind of odd to me as I was watching myself do it and it occurred to me to talk about it. I was not even consciously doing it. It's just something that over time, it's almost like muscle memory. Hamish is done. You know, one of the busts that I'm really excited to paint one of these days, probably be the next actual bust I paint, um, other than the Celtic busts. But I might just keep working on a few of them, get a few more of those sets done. But the next non-Celtic bust I'm going to paint, um, I have from White, I think it's White Shark Gaming or White Shark Studios or White Shark Models, something like that. They made a bust of Quinn from the Jaws movies, so the captain of the boat from the, well, not the movies, but from the first movie. Um, and so it's it's going to be a lot of fun. He's a little bit larger scale than these. I think he's a one-tenth or, this, these are one-twelfth scale. I think he's a one-tenth or one-eighth scale, so a little bit larger. Um, but he's got his baseball cap on. He's got his kind of denim type shirt. Um, so the textures on, on those fabrics are going to be really, really fun to bring to life. 
also try to capture a little bit of the you know, the sunburnt, grizzled old sailor. Be really fun. I also own uh, a couple of the Nico Galaxy busts. Those things are really, really cool. And I have the vampire, the three vampire busts from uh, Carol Rudick. So you might have seen Soshi Bauer has recently been uh, painting up Elisabetta. I think that's the name of the one model, the female one. Such a such amazing details, and those are also a little bit larger scale. I think those might be one eighth scale. Could be one tenth scale, but somewhere around there. A little bit larger. Um, so those will be fun. And I have a Hellboy bust, which will be a fun challenge. It's based more on the uh, the comic book design instead of the movie design. I also have a Hellboy 32 millimeter scale model. Again, based, based more on the comic book design. I'm really excited to paint that guy, and, I'll, and here's why. Not only because he's cool, Hellboy. But I'm going to do a little bit of a diorama with him. Where I'm going to take um, a cell from one of the comic books. It has kind of the very particular Mike Mignola... Uh, style of background, you know, the statues that have that very particular cell shaded look to them. And I'm going to paint that cell on like a piece of plastic card that I'm going to attach to the back of the of a plinth. And then on the top of the plinth have sort of rubble and different things that, you know, from some big fight that Hellboy's had and have the model on there. And so it almost will look like a three dimensional uh, cell from the comic book. And I'm going to paint the, the miniature itself in a little bit more of that style. Um, but it'll be really, really cool to have kind of a little mini Hellboy diorama. Don't know when I'm going to get around to that, but I am excited to do it. All right, so we got that part done. Yeah, maybe I'll do that Hellboy one on stream in the future. Once we get done with this paint along, that the streams will be the place where I'll probably, for the next several months at least, for the rest of the year, and probably into next year, will be the place where I'll actually get to paint stuff for myself. Because uh, I'll be doing a lot of Atlantis miniatures, dwarfs, during my normal painting time. Um, coming up pretty soon here. I probably should have already started on them, but I just got way behind on finishing up these sample busts just because of work. and. Real life always gets in the way. But yeah, as soon as I finish that Hamish bust up, I'll be finishing cleaning up the next half dozen or so dwarves that I gotta work on. Some cool ones in the next set coming up too. The gladiator one. So he's got a shield and then he's got a like a ball and chain kind of weapon, but the ball on the end of it is a like an iron fist. So that's pretty cool. Um, there's somebody riding, uh, a, a female warrior riding a saber-toothed tiger that I get to paint. Uh, the king and the queen models, which are sitting on their thrones. Um, the pygmy elephant with a big, I don't know, is it palanquin? What, uh, what's the name of the thing that would be on the back of the elephant that people would ride on and fight from? I can't remember the exact word. I think something like that. And I know I'm close, but I don't know exactly what it is. But there's some cool, cool models in the next sets coming up. All right, what's next? Where are we at here? 340. So I'm going to do the orange areas. I'm going to bring this picture back up and show you this. Um, So 
So with the orange, like the you're not really getting necessarily. It's kind of hard to explain, but like when I look at this, I don't see the same amount of sort of striping texture on the orange, which creates like two different colors of oranges. Um, whereas like in the dark green, you see the dark green, and then you also see the lighter green on top of that. Um, so what I did with this orange was rather than try to get the striping with the orange, because there's not a lot as much contrast, I ended up doing striping with um, like an actual off-white color. So like something like this. So right now, all I want to do is start to bring in a little depth to the orange. So I have in my notes here that what I did was I added thar and brown, or thar brown. I wrote tharn, but that's not the color name. So add some thar brown. Let's see how this looks. kind of checking it against what I had before. It should be good. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of do a little bit of just sort of dabbing. Like I'm not going to worry too much about being too fine on this. I'm going to focus on the raised areas of the, the orange. Obviously, I want to stay within the orange. I don't want to mess up the dark line I just painted. But I'm just kind of hitting some of the raised areas. I'm not worrying about if I don't get a, a complete full coverage. I'm not that worried about it. It just even adds more to the texture. So I'm not worrying about getting a solid coat here. He's looking at you disapprovingly for not working on your bust right now. Why aren't you painting me, Jesse? Sorry. I, uh, so I probably just did all of that without anybody seeing what I was doing. Great. Um, sorry about that. Yeah, basically what I did was I just, along the raised areas, just kind of went like this. You know, left left to the recesses alone. Um, but yeah, again, not worrying about getting too solid of a coat. 
you should see there's a little bit darker orange down in the, the recesses, a little bit brighter on the top. <sighs> I'm just going to blame the, t the exhaustion. Next up, do the the lighter green um, actually no I'm going to do the darker green because the darker green area uses this color the base coat of the lighter green as the first texture color and on this one I'm going to actually paint the lines I'm looking at my sample busts, what I did on this. Looks like I mostly just went um, parallel to the stripes, the under layer. I'm just painting really thin, really thin lines that go parallel with the stripe colors. Now what's nice with this is you really don't have to go down into the shadows. Um, you wouldn't really pick up that thread texture down in the shadows as much. Plus we're going to do a lot more shading down there, which would hide a lot of it. So I'm going to focus on the more visible areas. This is a spot where you could do some very, very careful uh, dry brushing if you want, as opposed to painting the stripes. Um, maybe you have a little bit more paint than you would normally have on your brush. Um, the only thing I would say about this would be be careful with your brush stroke directions. Try to keep the brush stroke directions um, going horizontal and vertical to the, the fabric. to give the impression that it's fabric and not just like dust all over the model or something. You want to you want to have the, the kind of the streaks going in those directions. I almost gave Mel Gibson here an or a green chin. That would not have been good. Sounds good, man. Sweet corn, green beans, potato and leek soup. Sounds pretty healthy, man. I wasn't sure I was going to get to stream when I was trying to set up my stream earlier. It kept crashing on me. So at first I was wondering if we were even going to be able to have this today. But closed, reopened the program a couple times and finally it seemed to, to stay on. We were getting something like, when I first launched, You know, like 45% of the frames were getting dropped. So you would have only been seeing 50% of what I was doing.
Now there's a story. Oh, that sucks, man. I will tell that to your doctor though. Give him give me your give me his number. Um so when I was in Scotland, apparently uh, the way the Braveheart movie happened was the guy who wrote the script was just you know, touring Scotland. And I'm pretty sure it's Edinburgh Castle. There are statues of Robert the Bruce and William Wallace on either side of the, the entrance into the castle. So like where the gate is and then down above that. And he was asking either his tour guide or one of the people who was stationed there sort of you know, guarding the entrance to the castle just as a security guard kind of person. Oh, who are the statues of? And he said, oh, that's you know, William Wallace and Robert the Bruce. And they were you know, instrumental in the Scottish War for Independence against England. And he said something about, oh, they must have been really good friends or you know, something like that. And... This person told him, he's like, oh, there's actually rumors that Robert the Bruce betrayed William Wallace. And that was where the guy says, well, this must be a, a interesting story. I'm going to dig a little bit more into this. And um, hence the movie was born. Despite the liberties that he took in writing the story. <laughs> I already did him. I'll tell you guys, I'm tired. All right, so we need to add some Thar Brown to this. Oh, we're about to get a kitty bumping against the, oh, maybe not. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that didn't happen in real life. Um, also, impregnating the you know the future Queen of England also did not happen. Um, William Wallace was dead by the time she would have. I think I think he died. She was not even born yet, or she was a little kid, still living in France. All right, so we're gonna go back over the same sections. I'm gonna keep doing a little bit of the, the cross hatching in the same direction. Um, you know, one of the weird things with history is it's really hard. I mean, that that happened a fair amount of time ago. And it's really, really difficult to have reliable records of a lot of historical events. Um, and so, you know, what gets passed down a lot of times is is really, you know, stories and, and uh, folklore and so who knows what really happened? There's just not a lot of official records of you know, William Wallace's life and
Right, so certain things like um, you know battles and things would have been recorded about what happened, but a lot of that kind of history is is almost more educated guessing. Moving out here in the, the Western United States, I think one of the most interesting, like, kind of historical, uh, I don't know if lies is quite the right word, but you know, the way that myths become you know, larger than life and become um, more real than history is uh, the history of like Wyatt Earp Doc Holliday and the OK Corral, all stories similar to that. You know the the gunfights between the outlaws and the the lawmen. In reality, most of the people who were marshals and sheriffs and those kind of people out in the West were not often not all that different from the outlaws. Just one of the sides had a badge. Um, you know if you if you go research the real history of the Earp brothers. They were not good dudes. They were not necessarily the people you would, you would want, you know, protecting your honor and, um, again, they, they really weren't too different from the people that they were fighting against other than just that they happened to be the ones with the badges. It's a book called The Last Gunfight, which is, does a pretty good job of telling the story. Recommend it if you're at all interested. All that being said, Movie Tombstone's pretty darn good. Just like Braveheart's good, despite its uh, liberties. All right, I'm gonna take the same color. I just did those second um, second stripes with and I'm going to go over the lighter green area and I'm going to do this one kind of like I did with the orange where or I'm, yeah where I'm not that worried I'm not going to make quite stripes with this but I'm also not going to worry about getting complete coverage I'm just sort of hitting the highlight areas with some lighter color actually have a essentially a bachelor's in history did a lot of that and studied a lot of history in college 
Um, one other thing that's interesting to me is just how much of our history we kind of take a little bit on faith based on first-hand accounts of the time without always considering the agenda that the writer might have had. You know, professional historians are a little bit better about about this just because they're they're more aware of it but you know kind of the stuff that gets sold to us like the movie Gettysburg has a lot of a lot of the focus is on um, oh, what's his name the school teacher guy who held the flank at Little Round Top I can't think of his name right now um, but most of that story is based on his autobiography about what happened there. And so you wonder, you know, would somebody writing an autobiography about what they did in this really pivotal moment in history, might they have reason to embellish a little bit? Might they have reason to take some credit for things that other people did? And I'm not saying that's necessarily the case with him. But it would be hard to know. And so when then historians read his firsthand account, or you know Hollywood movie makers or people who write, because that's based on a book, uh, the movie Gettysburg is based on the book The Killer Angels. Um, you know, you read that account and then you create the, the script based off that account and then that gets made into a movie. Um, Kind of hard to know what actually happened. Just interesting things to think about. Add a little bit more Thar Brown to that. looks like on this I actually did focus a little bit more on um, doing a little bit of the cross or a little bit of the, the texture like the actual little lines so I'll do that might be a little hard to see on camera talked to Josh this last week who had come out here to Arizona in March and filmed a bunch of high def um, tutorials with me I'm still waiting to, for him to edit those and get them up I was chatting with him a little bit so he's still still hoping to get around to him he's just been busier than he expected the last few months with work which happens I can attest to that but hopefully at least you know one or two of those will start trickling in soon I did um, tutorials on freehand banners um, 
cloth textures. Color theory, brush care. I painted an entire model from start to finish, uh, one of the dwarfs. You can see, again, on that one, there's a lot of um, stuff about like glazing and putting in under textures and shading and there's stuff about doing tattoos. Um, kind of a little bit of everything in there. So looking forward to having you guys be able to see that. It'll be a nice companion piece to the the written tutorials I did because you can read the stuff in the written tutorials but then also have some of the video to back it up to see some specific brush strokes and hopefully those are going to come out clearer than what this webcam does here um, so you can you know see more zoomed in on the brush strokes and see everything just a little more a little cleaner You should start to see, you know, the, the texture, the cloth is starting to come alive a little bit. Like I showed off earlier when we just put the first coats down, it didn't really look anything like what it was going to look like when it was done. So we can start to see some of that, some of those finishes coming in. Still several steps away. Thanks, man. I can't wait for it either. It's just, you know, just simple. I didn't do too many tattoos on on the girl that for that video. It was, um, I think I just did some arm tattoos on one of her arms, maybe both arms. But it just shows, you know, doing the tattoo and then doing the glazing over that um, helps to sink it into the skin. Um, I also did that on Allie. If you get a chance to go back and watch those videos, um, I did a tattoo on her arm. So. All right, what's up next? Taking white sands. So this is a lighter off-white color. The other interesting thing that's in the video of that particular dwarf um, is I did her hair in blonde. So there's also essentially a blonde hair tutorial mixed into her as well, um, which I think is really important. There's a lot of people who struggle to paint blonde hair. And uh, a lot of the reason is because I think people like Simpsons artists have kind of conditioned us to think that yellow is the hair for Ye yellow is the color for blonde hair. You know, Barney Rubble back in the Flintstone days, and they just they colored their hair in yellow, and that was supposed to be blonde. Um, you know, blonde hair isn't really yellow. I mean, I have blonde hair. My hair doesn't really look yellow. Um, and so, what you really need to do is use, you know, like browns and ochres, uh, eventually off-white colors, and uh, that gets you some of the the blonde effects. Um, you don't really want to use like high saturation yellows, but that's what a lot of people try to do, and that's why you know, their blonde hair looks artificial. So that tutorial has blonde hair, and in fact, um, what's kind of funny, what I did for the, the William Wallace hair is I actually kind of painted it like a blonde hair, like a very light blonde hair first, um, and then I was glazing to bring in some of the browns and uh, start doing some of the shading, because when you look at some of his some of these pictures, that's not as much. 
I mean, you look at his hair, it's really not that dark of brown. And it's easier to darken things than it is to lighten them naturally. So if you start off with the lighter colors and then start glazing over and then start doing shading and bringing in the darker colors, it's a little bit easier to make it look realistic, in my opinion. So um, but I basically painted him blonde first and then went back in and did the brown. Um, so essentially you can think when we get to that point that it's kind of a blonde tutorial. And then behind that is how to turn that then into a uh, brunette. All right, this is where it gets a little, a little scary. Because we are going to be painting a very, very light color on top of this. This is not gonna be how it looks when we're all done because we still haven't done our glazing and shading, but um, these paint strokes are going to go perpendicular to the stripes. So, so far I've done things uh, parallel to the stripes to add some of that texture in there, but then these lighter stripes are going to all go perpendicular to those. The trick with this is you don't want too much paint on your brush because you don't want to glob this on. You don't want it to be super thick. Um, this is supposed to be picking out threads after all. However, like I said earlier, um, let me see if I can kind of show you what this is looking like here. Um, if you wanted to do dry brushing here, you could, as long as you're careful with the direction. So if you can see, what I'm painting on right here. So see these stripes going this direction? So that's what I'm painting on right now. You can see it's very, very thin. We just wanna give the illusion of that, the thread texture in the design. Like I said, you, if you wanna do some dry brushing here, just do your brush strokes the same direction I'm doing. Um, maybe have just a, a slight bit more paint on your brush so you're going to get the actual streaks as opposed to just little dots. Um, And again, focus more on the raised areas. We don't really have to do this down into the, the recesses too much. You don't have to make your brush strokes go like the whole length, um, but you do want to make them at least long enough to kind of carry on the design across the stripe colors. In other words, you kind of want to have decently long brush strokes here, ideally, but not lines that just go all the way.
Hey, non washable. What's up, man? Stream D&D &D game kind of overlaps with your Sunday stream. Sorry, I haven't been around much. That's no worries, man. Still love catching up the video on demands afterwards. The bus looks great. Always an obvious free handshake. I saw Mel Gibson earlier. Is this the identical color scheme from the movie? Yeah, so this is the... What we're, do, what we're working off of is essentially this concept art, or this um, reference picture, kind of crossed with this picture. Um, this is more, I think, you know, if we had to, if I had to guess, um, a little bit more of what the inspiration was, you know, as the sculptor was going. Um, looks a lot more like that pose. You can see the leather that's across his chest and um, things like that. So this is kind of the concept art. I like this, this other one we were looking at just because it gets close up to the fabric. Um, gives us a little nicer uh, look at the skin tone and the hair color and things like that as well. So that's kind of our, our reference picture there. And then we've got some reference pictures of Hamish to help us out with him too. But I'm basically painting his armor and um, tartan the exact same as I am Wallace's. But yeah, we're, we, are, we are going for uh, essentially a perfect match between, or close enough, um, between these two models. So working on the tartan right now. Hamish is almost done. I still haven't got around to quite finishing him. I just base coated his hair and beard. Got to do that to finish up the axe. I was, I was mentioning it earlier on the stream, but um, you know this, these pair of busts are limited to 90 copies each. We had 90 made, and you know, no more than that will ever be made or sold. So every pair comes with a certificate that has a numbered like casting number on them. And the first five of each set, I am painting up eventually. I mean, they'll all be painted up. So this is set one and two. I'll eventually have five painted sets, and they'll all be available for sale for anyone who just wants them for their collection or wants them to have, um, you know, reference in person as they go back and try to paint the busts. But I, I intend to make each pair slightly different, um, with the possible exception of this, you know, this pair is going to be the ones that are probably closest to each other. However, what I might do, I'm kind of thinking about this. Um, once I finish this, this set off, I might make essentially a bonus episode that is painting the face paint on them, like they, when they went to war and they put the blue face paint on themselves. So this pair might have the blue face paint, and then you know a future pair might have blood spatter from how they look with the face paint and the blood spatter after a battle. Um, I think there's a couple different face paint designs throughout the movie, so I might do a couple of the different designs. Um, might do one where I try to do kind of the um, object source lighting as if they're maybe sitting or standing in front of a fire. They've got cool shadows on the back. They've got a really nice warm front. So lots of oranges and stuff on the front and then blue tones in the other parts. So we'll see. I don't know what I'll do those last ones but I will eventually have five pairs painted which will all be available for sale if you want to for sure get in on that if you want to reserve one of the pairs let me know can even help decide what some of those later pairs look like if there's something in particular you want me to try.
So what I'm going to be doing, and I'll, I'm going to basically be done for today. Um, the next phases, the glazes and shadings and stuff is going to take more than the time I have available. So we'll start off next time with adding the, um, the glazes and shades to, to really make this cloth finish off. Um, so right now we've got all the texture, you know, all of that. So you can see the texture that we have um, built in there, but the tone isn't right and the shadows aren't there and things. So that's where we're going to start off next time is doing that, uh, those parts. So after, after I finish the, um, this pair, so finish him off, um, then I'm going to be starting on some Atlantis miniatures models again. So continuing their dwarf line. So that'll be a lot of my, my major painting time. So the next things that I'll be able to paint just for me will be once the paint along is all over, um, I will either, I'll, I'll probably do something different on stream. I won't keep painting more busts on stream. Um, those will probably just be something over the next year or so. I'll finish out the, the next three just kind of as, as I get time. Um, one of the things I want to do, and I don't know if I have it. I'll, I'll go grab. Um, I'll go grab. Them. Sorry about that, I couldn't find them for a second. Um, so I'll probably just keep using stream time to work on projects that I want to work on. And then, you know, my other painting time will be the dwarfs. But I got this uh, Kickstarter fulfillment a week or two ago by um, the Blacksmith Miniatures. So the world of Jean-Baptiste. So some really, really characterful sculpts. So almost like like gnomes, leprechauns kind of uh, thing. So this this guy is really cool with the bulldog that has a cricket on his head. Bulldog's got a lantern in its mouth. So that was Crooks of London, and it came with a special base with like a lantern. Um, and so the scale is pretty is pretty good. Like you can kind of see how big the dog is. And my thumb, kind of see how the how big the the leprechaun guy is. So he's cool. There's the key keeper model, which is cool. I really like this guy, St. Patty's Day. It's like a little leprechaun with a with a beer. Um, there's some gnomes, like garden gnome looking things, riding a ferret. You can see that's a pretty nice uh, scale miniature. Uh, Tinkerbell riding a bird. What else we got in here? A couple, um, well, another a kobold. So kind of like a leprechaun with a, looks mischievous. He's got an axe. And then there were two um, busts. These are fairly small. They're about probably about similar scale to the, the Braveheart busts maybe, but a couple little busts on that. So... What I might do is um, either just pick the one that just speaks to me when it gets to the time that I'm going to be painting those, or maybe I'll do a little poll on Twitter, see which of these models people actually want to see me paint the most, and just make that my next stream project. I'm, 
I'm excited to paint one of these. I think you know the style's a little bit different from some of the stuff that I've been doing. It'll be a nice break from um, the other models I'm painting. So I'm excited about these. I think that's probably the next most exciting thing. Um, I thought about maybe doing a 75 millimeter scale model, something that's kind of like Alley. You know, one of maybe the scale 75, um, uh, either well, one of the scale 75 uh, models. There's like some pirates I have and different things. But since I did an alley who was at 75 millimeter scale, and you know, maybe just for something totally different, do one of these models. That's kind of my, my plan. Um, but yeah, looking forward to it. Girlfriend says ferret. Oh, we're gonna catch up here. You look super awesome. Reminds me of Secret of Nim, yeah. Definitely I think I'd vote for the ferret. Girlfriend says ferret as well. Yeah, you would pick the, the largest, most complicated of those kits, right? <laughs> um, although, I don't know, I guess this bird looks kind of um, interesting, too, just in terms of complexity of, of actually painting the, the model. But yeah, the ferret. Yeah, I, I couldn't not buy that ferret. That ferret is awesome with garden gnomes on it or whatever those are. Yeah, really cool. But all right, I got to go get ready. We have my brother-in-law's uh, birthday party is tonight. And we got to go to that and then come back home and do some more work tonight. So um, it's been fun hanging out with you guys. I really appreciate you uh, supporting me and coming to the stream. And I hope that uh, you're continuing to learn new things from this paint along. Um, those of you at home who have the busts, um, hopefully that you're trying these things out. Again, send me pictures of this on social media. I'd, be, I'd love to share your works in progress on the stream, um, give you tips or, or help you out if you're stuck on something or if something's not quite looking right. Um, Maybe I can give you some help. But yeah, please don't hesitate to do that. If you don't have the busts, maybe this is the first time you've joined me, you're just hearing about this, paint along. Uh, those Celtic busts can be purchased at my website. It's on the screen there, gorillawithabrush.com. Uh, there's a tab at the top that says Celtic busts. You can order it there. Or you can contact me on social media. Give me your email address, and I can send you an invoice if you prefer to do it that way. Um, and then you can pay that to PayPal invoice, so you can just pay it that way. But anyway... Um, yep, see you, Jesse. See you, non washable. Uh, Heath was in here earlier. Um, it's good to have you hanging out too, Heath. And if there was anybody lurking and just hanging out, thanks for stopping by also. Um, again, have a great week. I will see you next week.